at the moment. And uh, it's a, so should we give the Archbishop a real warm... <laughs> there's a wonderful tea awaiting us, so um, that will help me speed up a bit. <laughs> um, first of all, as we, uh, I keep being told by everyone that this is uh, the area where Winnie the Pooh was written, I just want to say something about Winnie the Pooh. Um, on, very soon after I became Bishop of Durham, I, was, um, I discovered that the church commissioners had not only sold the house, but what they'd actually done was they'd sold the pictures and thrown in the house uh, at Auckland Castle because the pictures were by someone called Perberin, written Zerberin, but I'm not an art expert, so Thurberin or something like that. And, um, and they'd sold them um, for a huge amount of money. And then, uh, and very soon after I arrived, Rowan, uh, invited me for uh, a dinner to celebrate this huge transaction with the head of the church commissioners and the um, Archbishop of York and the Bishop of London, as Richard at the time, and I was completely overawed by this. And um, I got out of the, because, you know, I, I'd only been to Land of Palace once in my life before, and it is a terrifying place. And I got out of the she came up the surface as a message on my phone, would I ring um, up uh, uh, the church commissioners? And they said, the buyer has just withdrawn. Well, it really was a case of the table is made, and the buyer was coming for the dinner, plus, for some reason, a Russian oligarch. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea why, there, I, to this day, I have no idea what he was doing there, but he was perfectly charming. Um, and didn't invade anyone. And he, um, we, uh, so I got there and Rowan was there and I said, Archbishop, um, can I have a quick word? And he said, yes. I said, this is a celebration of the sale, isn't it? He said, yes. I said, um, uh, it's fallen through. <laughs> oh, he was quite calm about it, he said. <laughs> and he said, why? And I said, have you ever read Winnie the Pooh? <laughs> so he gave me a very archbishoply straight look and said, I have two children, of course I've read Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> I felt rebuked. But I said, well, if I say that the bar is Tigger and has just bounced off somewhere else, does that make sense? And he said, ah. Oh. He said, there is almost no situation on earth that cannot be fully interpreted with the hermeneutical <laughs> <laughs> I just, only Rome could get away with that sentence <laughs> and make it sound really, really profound. <laughs> um, anyway, so to help you along, I am essentially evil. <laughs> okay. So you just need to bear that in mind and lay off for that. Um, the second thing I want to say is thank you to very, very much to you for coming this afternoon. I have no illusions about how busy um, you are, how busy your roles in rural ministry are, and I'm profoundly and deeply grateful. And I wanted, thirdly, to say um, something about the pressures and well-being for, for clergy. Uh, particularly in, well, all over the place, but everywhere. But I think rural areas have their own particular strains and stresses. I know something about it, because I was seven years as rector of a rural parish, which was a very small uh, rural town. It had had, it was very keen on calling itself a town, because it had had um, a, a, a certificate from King John, <laughs> um, and so, which clearly gave it a market, and apparently that made it a town. Um, but actually, it was a very big village. And um, also a small village nearby. And uh, 
it was called it's southern in warwickshire and the village was often uh just down the road the village this may ring a bell was um i mean it if it had been called dibley it wouldn't have changed <laughs> many of you will understand that comment um uh, i had the first pcc i had uh, with the, my colleague uh, the curate there, and uh, there was a woman in her 50s. And we went along to the PCC, and we were talking about the organ or something uh, in this little village and in the church. Um, and suddenly, Jack, whose funeral I took a couple of years later, who was the oldest inhabitant of the village, and you could all top this story, I don't doubt it, but it illustrates some of the issues, um, said, Rector, I saw a Zeppelin once. We weren't talking about Zeppelins. <laughs> Zeppelins were not on the agenda. I've never put Zeppelins on any PCC agenda. But I might try the Archbishop's Council one of these days just for fun. And I said, oh, um, Jack, did you? Where was that? He said, it was coming up Afton Hill. I said, oh, right. He said, well, I was coming up Afton Hill. The Zeppelin was in the sky, just in case I'd misunderstood. <laughs> so I said, right. And then we moved back to talk about <laughs> and you, I mean, you will all have been in moments like this. And you think, I think I've fallen through the looking glass. <laughs> anyway, we went to the pub afterwards. <laughs> but I was seven years um, in Southern Afton, and Southern was a town that had been about three or four thousand and had grown to eight thousand. And I took over from, it, there were about 35 or 40 people going to church. There was no heating, no lighting, and you know, the normal stuff. And it grew very significantly. Afton um, was a village of about 200, and I took over with 18 and left it with eight. Um, so I, I'm, and I buried the other 10 after they died. <laughs> and um, it was, so I am, I just remember being more stressed during those years than at any other time in my life, including now including in this role. The stresses here can be quite considerable, but nothing like that, because it just felt so isolated and so pressurised. And you can, for me, I continually felt the whole weight of the thing was on me. And if you're an eel, that really doesn't work very well. So, I am well aware of the pressure you're under, particularly post, during and post-Covid, I'm particularly struck by Gary's comment that a number of people haven't come back, as it were. Mm. And that in rural ministry, more than urban, rural and outer estate ministry, incidentally, the loss of one or two people can completely transform your work life and the pressure you're under. The people who smile at you, the people <coughs> who do things willingly, the people who... <coughs> That's not me, is it? No. The people who do all kinds of helpful things, um, it can completely, the people you can go out for a drink with and have a chat with, and when they get to the point where they just are not up to keeping going, it is utterly exhausting. And that's why um, it seems to be one of the key things which I take very seriously is that as we go forward in the great crises that we have faced over the last nine years, ten years, um, and I'll come back to those in a minute. One of the key things must be resourcing, not demanding. And resourcing means, and we're trying to do this, that resourcing means providing things that are very uh, low maintenance to do and will be useful in 
you're in the minist in your ministry. Because frankly, if you blew up Lambeth Palace and Bishop Thorpe, I said this to the Archbishop Law, and all the House of Bishops, when they were all sitting there, and the General Synod, particularly in the rural areas, nobody would notice for quite a long time. As long as you left payroll and pensions in place, that's useful. Uh, I'm not saying the other isn't useful, but for centuries, the rural church kept going without any of that stuff. And the rural church will keep going, because God's in charge. Finally, not thankfully, archbishops. We are part of the crises we faced over the last nine years are essentially, there's, there's been three huge ones which are, have dominated my own thinking and my life to a considerable degree in the Church of England, though not in all my work because the crises overseas have been um, very often worse. I was in Pakistan last week. Um, we haven't had terrorist attacks where they've killed 160 people in a church and suicide bombers have deliberately walked into the middle of the Sunday school and set off the bomb there, so 60 of those people were small children. Um, you know, the, we are in a better position than that. But it doesn't make the stresses less. Everyone's pressure is their own pressure. Um, and the crises have been safeguarding um, COVID and remain, there remains the chronic crisis of buildings and demographics, elderly congregations and beautiful but utterly demanding buildings. I always used to say in Southern, and we did eventually manage it, I think, that I used to say in Southern, uh, our job is to make that thing serve the church rather than the, ser the church sacrifice its future to that thing. We had a very nice 13th century building. But it was an idol. And we all bowed down and worshipped it. And the future of the church, uh, it was a Moloch. It consumed our future. Rural is secure because it just keeps going. But it is particular because the challenges and opportunities it faces are enormous. And rural is going to change enormously in the next 30 or 40 years. Not just because the whole world's changing with technology and science, not just because of climate change, though I'll come back to that in a second because it's hugely important, but also because one of the major impacts in the urban areas is that we now, most big companies are now recognizing if you want to recruit staff, you are gonna to have to say you can work from home two or three days a week. And an awful lot of companies, it's more church houses, almost empty. And they're getting rid of three of their four or five floors completely. They will do something completely different with them because there's no one at the desk and they don't need people at they don't need those deaths, and that's happened in two years. The head of Facebook in the UK said to me recently, from the point of view of how they work, they have advanced, they, they had anticipated this, and they said it will happen by 2030 to 2035, and it happened in six months when COVID struck. And this is going to shift people into the rural areas, particularly in places like Sussex, because people will want to live there where they've got a bit more space and better air. And some of that will be a blessing because people will move out here um, and their families will move out and there'll be more people in schools. And, and this is, it may not happen, but it seems there's a very, I wouldn't have said two years ago there was even the faintest chance of that. But now we would say, I think most people would say there is a real possibility of a demographic change in that place which will be a blessing. But it will also be a change. And we all know from rural ministry how much uh, that is welcome in, area, in rural areas. But that is one thing. And how that will... The second thing I want to point to is 
Rural is secure because you have partnerships. It's how it works. You partnership with the with the town council, the parish council, the local school. <clears throat> Most of our church schools are in rural areas, and they're good partnerships on the whole, not always, but very often they are. And we still have a franchise which is extraordinary. I mean, the point about harking back to the congregation at Upton was I took the funerals, and in, as many of you will know from your experience in major urban areas, funeral ministry has disappeared. We only had one funeral director in the, in the village, in Southam, uh, who did all the local area, and called Afton, uh, called um, Goodwins. How'd you know that? Because came from Oh, because <laughs> he came from Bradle, just down the road. And Goodwins was a hardware store at the front and bodies and coffins at the back. <laughs> so you'd go in and you'd say, I'll have... And it was the only place I know where you could go in and say, I'll have four ounces of nails, please, uh, or screws, and I need three of those, and two of those, and five of those. And they literally sold them in weight, as they were used to. And I suppose you could have gone in and said, I'll have four ounces of screws and a coffin, please. Yeah. And, you know, they could have sold you... And they were extraordinary. Old Mr. Goodwood sitting, uh, standing at the back, and when the, ser the service had gone on too long, he had the change clinking in his pocket. <laughs> um, they were great. They actually were fabulous people. And Rural Church will go on because we're part of the community. People really do feel the church is important. It matters. It's not irrelevant. And the nature of the church is also evangelistic. But evangelism in a rural area is completely different to evangelism in an urban area. Of course it's about the Holy Spirit working in people's hearts and changing them. But how you, how you enable people to hear is so very different and so utterly relational. It's about getting to know people over years and years and years. It's about things like messy church, where the kids come along and then sooner or later Someone else comes along. It's about being good at doing funerals and good at doing weddings and welcoming. When I got, when I got seven, the previous vicar didn't like people who weren't regular churchgoers to having baptisms, coming to baptisms. And he made it very clear. So the first thing we did was, to be honest, we went for a pretty open baptism policy. Someone knocked at the door and said, said Hello, Greg, so will you do my baby? Um, you know, and you, one always resisted the temptation just to say, do what to your baby, madam? <laughs> <laughs> but I did resist the one. But you say, you'd say, oh, that's wonderful. How lovely. Yes, please. And you found that if you were half human and sober some of the time, um, they'd sort of start coming on to church after a while. We did alpha courses and all that. But they were done in a very relaxed, laid-back way. And, you know, it sort of built up a bit. But I did find it very tiring. Um, but we need to be evangelistic because the love of God pours into the world through the ministry and love of the church. The love of God is, in Colossians 1, is about the, the work of the Spirit of God through Christ is sustaining and keeping creation in place, but the church is also Christ to the world. And that's not a barrier. Rural church has very fuzzy edges, not hard barriers. I don't think any church should have hard barriers. That's a whole different subject. So it really matters. It is sustainable. But we've got to tackle the huge issues, because our, I honestly don't know the answer, some people may. I don't know how we look after the buildings. And there's an old saying, full churches don't fall down. It's true. But when you've got 200 people in the village in a building that holds 160, you're asking for quite a high church attendance rate. That's 80%. 
you know, if you're going to keep it full, or if you say half the pew's full, that's 80, and that feels full in most churches. And the issues in the vision and strategies developed by Stephen Koshel, the Archbishop of York, of simpler, humbler, and bolder are, are relevant to the role. But working out what that means has got to come from your thinking and not from top down, because it just doesn't work. It doesn't even work when you do it, it comes from Dyson Church House, let alone from Whitehall or Westminster or wherever it is, wherever we live. So I'm not here to tell you that how to deal with the issues. Building's one, demographics is another. Climate change, I'll just say something very briefly about that. It is. I did a big speech for the NFU recently. Climate change is going to have the most monumental effect. I personally, and I may well be wrong, don't believe that the right way forward is to turn farms into essentially uh, entertainment zones. The farmers exist to produce food. And if we don't produce food, we're going to have a problem. And we are not self-sufficient in food. And when wars start, food matters. Automation is going to have a huge impact. I, from my childhood in, with my grandparents in North Norfolk, I remember a farm of a thousand acres, agri, uh, arable farm of a thousand acres, probably have 10 to, 15 stu uh, 10 to 15 employees. Nowadays, it's probably the farmer and some subcontract labor. It'll be a lot less than that when the farmer can program his tractor to go and do the harvesting for him. And with AI and robotics, it will do it, <coughs> his combine. Um, I'm not sure we've got robot cows yet, thankfully. <laughs> But it is going to change very dramatically. The, the rural economy is under huge pressure. Population change, technological change, scientific change, nature of crops, crops that are adaptable to hotter climates, more rain, more storms that can cope with that. These are all things that are going to come together. And because of the role of the rural church, incumbents and clergy right across the rural area are indispensable. You'll have some questions, but I suppose I want to finish by saying, as you can guess, being an eel, I'm never an optimist. But there's a story about 100 years ago, the 90s, during the talks that led up to the Good Friday Agreement, uh, my chief staff, David, Porter is from Northern Ireland, and he uh, told me this story. The minister had come out of the talks, and the press had said, Minister, are you optimistic of an agreement? He'd say, no, but I'm always hopeful. We are not optimists or pessimists. That's just a matter of character. But we are hopeful, because in the end, the church is in the hands of God. And the rural church has survived since 597, um, 800 roughly in its modernish form, it has survived revolutions and wars and plagues and invasions and defeats and victories and economic change, and it is still here. In the end, it is God who sustain us, sustains us. The light has come into the world, and the darkness has not overcome it, nor will it. Thank you very much.